So, Denepazil, <coughs> Denepazil is now subsidised within New Zealand. It used to be a special authority drug, but now it's subsidised. Um, that will be on the handouts you get later. It's basically just an overview of the four main trials that looked at Denepazil in early to moderate Alzheimer's disease. It works a bit in some people. Um, real world experience of Denepazil is not quite as good as the studies. There does seem to be quite a large placebo effect, which wears off much quicker than the real effect. There's also a significant reporting bias. So think about it. Your loved one has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. You've been offered, they and you have been offered the option of one of these medications. You've been told, you know, they're not great. It might help a bit. Come back in six weeks and tell me how it's going. What are they going to say? It's working. They always say it's working. There may be absolutely no objective evidence that it's helping at all. There may be no change in cognitive screening, but people cling to hope, don't they? And if it's, if it's a last best hope is a pill, then they'll tell you it's working. Do they <laughs> use it in Alzheimer's disease or do they use it in other forms? Of it, it does get used in other forms of dementia and it is, it, it, it is worth trialling them. The, the response to Denepazil is, you know, um, can be quite quirky. And I've had the odd patient who seems to do absolutely brilliantly on it, which I cannot explain, and no one else can that I've talked to. Um, and you can't predict, you can't look at 20 patients and say, that's the one that's going to get a benefit. So you end up putting all 20 of them on it and see what happens. Uh, which, you know, of course, uh, with the greatest of respect, drug companies love. They've got 20 people on the drug that might be only benefiting one. Um, so the guidelines do suggest that these medications should be trialled for a minimum of six weeks, provided they're tolerated. And at the end of six weeks, there should be some objective assessment of whether they're actually helping. And if they're not, you should discontinue them again, which, again, is the really hard bit, saying to people... I don't think it's working. I think we should stop it again because the inevitable re response is, can we give it a bit longer? So, you know, <coughs> forgive me if I'm coming across as entirely cynical. <laughs> Does the spouse involved get any formal questionnaire or anything like that so that they can actually have something to go by? Yeah. Because I find it very really interesting that you talk about the placebo effect and yet I'm in palliative care. If we gave people morphine and it wasn't working, they sure as hell wouldn't be waiting six weeks to tell us. So, you know, it, yeah. it's very much what is the drug for and yeah. what are the expected benefits, but would, would the spouses get some information and what to look Oh, absolutely. For? Yeah, and, and in terms of, you know, um, potentially slightly more objective measures, you can give people things like quality of life questionnaires and... And the studies have looked at quality of life benefits. That again, they're very modest to non-existent. But you know, and that it, it involves the person, doesn't it? It involves the family as part of the assessment. I, I'm just saying again, forgive me for being very cynical. You just have to be mindful that there's a lot of hope and bias. <laughs> so, what do you use for your objective <coughs> benefit? Uh, we use the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive uh, Assessment. Um, Many of you will know that traditionally we, we used to use the MMSE, the Mini Mental States Examination. The main reason we've gone away from that is that the MMSE is copyrighted. And um, although, as far as I'm aware, there's never been yet a test case of anybody being prosecuted for using it without paying to use it, it's potentially a matter of time before that happens. So the decision was really made at quite a high level, the, the National Dementia Group, that within New Zealand, the preferred standard tool would be the MOCA. And what, benef what objective benefit do you need to see? To Ideally, you're looking for an increase of two or more points. Yeah. You would have put use those screening tools, the MOCA and the MMSC. Do you have an opinion of the... I think I like the mocker. Uh, it's easy. It's it's as easy to administer. One of the advantages to the mocker is there are different versions of it, so you can actually rule out a training effect. So you know, if you keep administering the same test to people, 
even if they've got some cognitive deficits, they can actually learn the, the test. And by using the different versions of the Mocha, you can overcome that. One of the things I'm always have, you know, always have in the back of my mind is that the Montreal Cognitive Assessment was not specifically designed to pick up dementia. It was designed to pick up mild cognitive impairment. So you actually, it's, in a sense, it's more sensitive. You actually have to have a bigger drop on the Mocha than you would have done on the MMSE to be more suspicious of dementia rather than mild cognitive impairment. Um, like all these, like all screening tests of cognition, it's quite sensitive to educational level mood, as, as Dryden was saying before. But it's kind of what we've got, and it's useful for serial monitoring. So uh, that's that's what we use. Um, so you know, denepazil might work, might not. Worth a try. Um, the starting dose is five milligrams. It's usually given at night. If the person tolerates it, you increase it to 10 milligrams after four weeks, and then you assess for effect at six weeks. Um, for those people who can't or won't swallow a pill, there is a disintegrating uh, version. Um, interestingly, I said I wasn't going to talk about BPSD, but it can actually have uh, an effect on BPSD symptoms, but again, it's not predictable. Uh, so there are some patients who it may not have an effect on their memory or function whatsoever, but the family will report they're much calmer and they seem happier. One thing we're seeing is, you know, for the um, changing the course of the dementia, it's licensed for mild to moderate dementia, but then people with more severe dementia who've got significant anxiety, sometimes to never stop yeah, and, and again, I would count that as part of its possible effects on the PSD. Yeah. And, sorry, and the other thing we see is we can stop those people you call us. Yes, that is also true. I've certainly seen that where it's been stopped because the person has, you know, progressed beyond what you think is the useful timeline and then they get a lot worse. Yes. As pharmacists, we're not saying that it needs to be stopped if there's no improvement in cognition, but we think that if it is stopped, there's a possibility that behaviour might get worse. And if it's being well tolerated and the person is taking it, you know, to some extent, is it doing any harm to carry it on? I mean, you know, I'm a big fan of deprescribing and I try and avoid polypharmacy, but if it's not broken, don't fix it. Um, it isn't well tolerated, that's the thing in, in my experience. Um, the 10 milligrams particularly, people will often tolerate the five milligrams but not the 10. If that's the case, don't just stop it, knock it back to the five and see how they go on that. The commonest adverse effects are gut related. It can cause abdominal pain, bloating, diarrhea, vomiting. In some people, in most people, if they're going to tolerate it, that will settle down in a few days, but in some people it is just intractable. You need to be aware it can cause significant bradycardia. It's quite rare, but ideally it's nice if someone's monitoring the pulse rate. Very rarely it can cause rhabdomyolysis and very rarely it causes GI bleeding. I've had one patient die from denepazil induced GI bleeding. So it's something to be aware of. If they're already on aspirin or an on steroidal, do have that in mind. It's rare, but when it happens, it, you don't feel very good about it, I can tell you. <coughs> so the next one is rivastigmine. It's never been compared head to head, and it never will be because they're made by different people. But the efficacy seems to be pretty similar, i.e. not great, but when it works, it can work. Um, the side effect profile is much the same. However, there is a transdermal patch which is available through special authority uh, and people tolerate that much better than the oral version. So again, if someone has side effects on, on a tablet, don't necessarily rule out that they might get some benefit from the patch. Galantamine isn't subsidised in New Zealand and I have no experience of it. I've never personally used it. Um, it seems to have similar efficacy to the other two, possibly slightly better if the trials are to be believed. But the adverse effects are much the same. 
Uh, and interestingly, if you use it in people with mild cognitive impairment but not dementia, they actually die. <laughs> There's an increased mortality. <coughs> now, always remember with research, one in 20 results occur by chance. We accept a statistical significance of 0.05%, which is 1 in 20. So always, again, you know, always be a little bit sceptical of research if you think, I don't understand why that would be. It may be that it's just chance. So memantine is the NMDA receptor. Um, this is also not subsidised in New Zealand. Uh, and this is essentially in countries where you can use it or if people are prepared to pay for it, it's what you would swap someone to when their dementia progresses from being mild to moderate and you think they're no longer benefiting from the other medications. They can be used in combination. There are some small trials that have looked at using cholinesterase <laughs> inhibitors and memantine and there may be a modest additive effect. Oops. Oh no, what have I done? Turned it off. That's not clever, is it? Uh, again, going reinventing the wheel. Who do we want to know about? The people who are not doing what you think they're likely to do. So the weird and wacky and wonderful um, early onset where you think there might be, you know, perhaps a genetic condition. Uh, HIV, of course, can be associated with the dementia syndrome. So again, if you've got a clinical suspicion, it's worth considering HIV testing or referring on to specialist services. With rapid and atypical presentation, you always think CJD. Um, as yet, I'm not aware that we've got any new variant CJD in New Zealand. I certainly saw it back in the UK. Uh, if there's a focal neurological deficit, think about other syndromes. There is a, an overlap between frontotemporal dementia and motor neuron disease. So about 10% of patients with motor neuron disease may present with cognitive issues before they present with physical issues. So, but you know, if you, if you detect physical abnormality, think, this, is this something else? Is it not Alzheimer's? <coughs> is it not vascular? Parkinsonism is an obvious one. There is a very clear overlap between dementia and Parkinsonism. If you have idiopathic Parkinson's disease, you are four times more likely to dement. Uh, than if you don't. And again, the physical changes can come first or the cognitive changes can come first. How rapidly evolving is the dementia with Parkinson's? Extremely variable. Extremely, yeah. Some people with Parkinson's never dement, but they are more likely to. Um, Again, onset of BPSD symptoms. Now, this, this does vary from region to region. Uh, where I work in Wanganui, if you referred a patient with BPSD to me, I would pass the referral to my psychogeriatric colleague, uh, Dr. Terry Johnson, who's great, and we work together and we have a lot of shared patients, but he is much more expert in the management of BPSD than I am. What is BPSD? Uh, the behavioral and psychological symptoms and signs of dementia. So, as you were saying before, dementia can result in anxiety, it can result in depression, it can result in behavioural change, um, agitation. You'll hear more about that this afternoon. Um, as with any, any elderly patient, if there's lots of complex comorbidities, I'm happy to get a referral, you know, because often these people end up on 20 or 30 drugs and they're all interacting and, the, you know, there are circumstances where the drugs counteract each other and Parkinson's is a good example for, of that. If someone's got physical features of Parkinson's disease and they've got cognitive changes maybe with some BPSD, the medications that we give to treat the physical aspect of the, the syndrome can make the cognitive issues worse and the medications that we give to treat the cognitive issues can make the physical symptoms worse. So, you know, obviously we don't want that. So these are the kind of people that I think it is useful to involve a specialist. The other thing is if you've got a disparity. Now, interestingly, yesterday I had a really good anecdotal case of this where I was asked to see a patient who was in hospital whose family were saying, she's very confused, she's got dementia, we think she needs to be in a rest home. 
and they gave this very nice history of how she wasn't managing things at home, she wasn't cooking anymore, and she wasn't looking after herself, and she wasn't washing. And I went to see this lady, and she'd only just come into hospital. She looked well nourished, she was well hydrated, she was clean. And I said to the family, you know, who's been, who's been helping her with these things? Oh, nobody. You know, we've just come from out of town and we've seen it, and she needs to be in a rest home. And I said to the lady, you know, are you wanting to go to a rest home? She said, oh, yes, I'd quite like to go to a rest home and be looked after, thank you very much. And she kept looking at the family, you know. Um, and when it came to do cognitive screening, it was blatantly obvious that this woman had been primed by the family to answer the questions wrong. And within the ward environment, she was functioning as well as anybody else within the ward environment. She was able to take herself to the toilet and manage quite independently. She remembered where the toilet was. She remembered where her bed was. So everything about this situation was screaming, this is not real. And in fact, you know, this was a very loving family who live out of town, didn't want their mum to be lonely at home anymore, thought she might be better off in a rest home. Would, I'd obviously had some sort of conflab together and said, what do we need to do to get her into a rest home? We'll make out as though she's demented. So if you see these disparities, you know, again, I'm not judging. Mm -hmm. uh, if you see these disparities, just be mindful that there are often other complex social dynamics going on that can influence what you think you're seeing. This, this is a, a, a whole other seminar, but there is a huge disparity around the country between uh, criteria for access to supports and residential care. I, I, I have issues with it, but I don't have the power to fix it. How do you handle how uh, ladies have been blatantly financially abused? Uh, I'm extremely fortunate because what I do is I refer them to the appropriate person who is trained and expert in managing that situation, which isn't me. <laughs> so we have a social worker and a police officer who both have training and experience in investigating and managing elder abuse, and they do it extremely well. And if someone comes to me and says, I think my brother is abusing my mother, I will say to them, thank you for bringing that into the open. I'm going to refer you on to the appropriate service. They will want to talk to you. They will want to talk to your mother. They will want to talk to the potential abuser. If it comes to a prosecution, you may be asked to give a police statement. Is, are you willing to take it that far? That's financial abuse you're talking about? Any abuse. Sexual, psychological, physical. It all goes on, sadly. But yeah, it's, it's a very um, sensitive and, you know, complex area and I think it deserves to be dealt with by experts. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. One unrelated question, but in your um, young, pre you know, uh, young presentation of dementia, so the patient I'm thinking of was probably in her early 50s, um, do, is the survival time still about eight to ten years, or do they tend to survive longer than someone who presents in the age? It's an average, isn't it? So you know, you, you're always going to get some who survive longer, and younger people, yes, you know, maybe slightly protected against the physical decline, but you know, often, often early onset dementia has a more rapid prognosis anyway. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. How am I doing for time? Let me check my own agenda. Oh, I've got a couple of minutes. Sorry, Dryden. <laughs> I just wanted to share with you another case, because I always think cases are how we, we polarise our memory of things. So this is a gentleman who I saw in my clinic. He's a 67-year-old retired civil servant who has a university degree. He's got a background of some mild COPD and he has previously been investigated for chest pain which was concluded to be musculoskeletal and his only medications are an inhaler and a bit of paracetamol. So earlier this year he was referred to me and he attended clinic with his wife and he was happy that she'd be part of the consultation. Um, he was 
quite bemused, didn't know, what, you know, why am I here, Doc? It's a common question. Um, he didn't think he had any concerns at all. And his wife reported that she definitely noticed over a period of several months that his memory was changing. He was losing things around the house, which was very atypical for him. And even with retracing his steps, he couldn't always find them. And sometimes they were in odd places. He'd put his glasses in the freezer. Um, she felt his concentration was poor, which was something that had previously not been an issue, particularly given the kind of job that he'd done. He couldn't remember the names of people he knew very well. Um, he was uncharacteristically agitated at times. Apparently, he'd normally been quite a placid sort of chap. And he was seeing things that weren't there. And interestingly, was not at all bothered by this. So even when people pointed out to him that the child he could see sitting on the sofa wasn't there, he was quite blasé about it. He's independently mobile, although he has been using a stick for a little while because he's had three falls, and both he and his wife are quite clear that these were not trips or slips. He'd spontaneously lost his balance. He's still independent, but he's getting a bit slower. And he stopped driving. He's, he is that person. He's made the decision to stop driving because he has other alternatives and his family had expressed concern. And he cared about what his family thought, as do most people. He's been using public transport quite safely. He goes on the bus to the library, spends a happy morning reading various things, and then goes home on the bus. There's been one episode where he rang his wife because he couldn't quite remember where the bus stop was. And she was able to tell him, and he had been able to ring his wife. And on examination, he's got some features of Parkinsonism. So this is the GP history, I should say. He's got a right-sided resting tremor. His face doesn't seem to be moving perhaps quite as well as it did. And he's got changes on his Montreal Cognitive Assessment. You would expect this man to score 30. He's got a university degree. It should be easy. <laughs> So he gets referred to me, and because I have the luxury of having 40 minutes in my clinic appointment and not the 7 to 12 that you have, I can get a bit more history. His wife comes again uh, with him. He's lost his sense of smell about 10 years ago, and he's got symptoms suggestive of REM sleep disorder. Now, does everyone know what that is? Does anyone want me to say what it is? Yeah, okay. When we sleep, there are different depths of sleep, aren't there? <coughs> different stages of sleep. And there is this uh, level of sleep which is very deep called REM, which stands for rapid eye movement. And when you are in that stage of sleep, you dream. You don't always remember your dreams, but that's, that's the level of sleep that you dream in. Now, normally, when you dream, your body is disconnected from, the, from your brain and you actually become paralysed. You don't know about it because you're asleep. So you don't move much in REM sleep. What happens with these people is that disconnect between the brain and the body doesn't happen. And so they, when they're dreaming, they, they often actually act out their dreams uh, or they move about. So they'll thrash about. They wake up on the floor with no memory of falling out of bed. Their wife or husband will say that they've punched them in the face. Um, they may be running in their sleep, skiing in their sleep, whatever it is they're dreaming about, they're doing it. And that's REM sleep disorder. So the person themselves often doesn't report it unless there has been, you know, I woke up covered in bruises and I don't know how I got them. It's usually someone that they sleep with who can tell you what's happening. It's a feature of Parkinsonism, which I'm sure you can see is where this is heading. Um, he's got mild postural hypotension. He's got a positive glabella tap. So if I tap you here, you might blink a couple of times, but then you stop. With Parkinsonism, they just keep blinking for ages. It's great fun. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> he's got mild rigidity in the right forearm. He's got a festinate gait, so he's got that, you know, smaller step length than usual. Whoops. And he's a bit unsteady on his feet, consistent with the history of having fallen three times. 
So he's got clear features of Parkinsonism, plus he's already got some cognitive change and he's got visual hallucinations. I'm pretty confident this chap's got Lewy body dementia and this is one of the subtypes. Again, you can argue to some extent it's academic. We're still going to wrap supports around him and his wife. We're still going to try the medications. But we're also, in his case, because he's got physical features of Parkinsonism that's affecting his fun function, he's falling over, he needs to use a walking stick, I've put him on a little bit of Mandapar as well. I have the luxury of working with a really good team and we work very closely with our mental health team for older people, including my colleague, Dr. Terry Johnson, who I've mentioned. We meet once a week and we discuss any new cases that we feel are going to be of relevance to the wider service so that we're all on board and we're all on the same page. So down the line, if Terry gets a referral on this chap, he'll already know about him. So we discussed him at our weekly meeting. Uh, he and his wife were offered follow-up by one of our community team case managers uh, who have um, a variety of healthcare professional backgrounds. We have therapists, nurses who have case management roles and offered a referral to supporting families. Now, Rebecca, you referenced this agency. I'm not sure if everyone else has a supporting families, but this is an organisation, it's a, a non-governmental organisation and they do what it says on the tin. They're not there for the patient. We've got the Alzheimer's Society and they're brilliant and they support families as well. But this is where families can go if they don't feel they can go anywhere else or if they need advice or they need additional support that isn't, that, that's about them. Because we're all patient-centred, aren't we? And, and of course we should be, but it isn't just the patient. They have the most amazing magazine plus it's online now. Okay. I'm very conscious I have now gone over time, so I'm going to shut up. Um, other than to say he was a bit better when I saw him again. He's tolerated the medication. His mocha hasn't improved, but his wife reports that several people have commented they think his head is a bit clearer. Is it? Is it placebo? Is it family bias? I don't actually care. He's tolerating the medication. He seems to be doing well. And they're very appreciative of all this stuff that they now know they can contact and access with.